Dr. Schuler, would you like to get us started? Thing. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight um, for our uh, our exciting uh, evening and, and opportunity. I don't want to take a, a lot of time up uh, in the, the introduction because we've got an incredible evening planned for you tonight um, with Dr. Bolton. But uh, one, I just want to say thank you at the onset to everybody for giving us uh, some of your time uh, tonight. We've got a very important topic to talk about um, how we go about uh, cultivating resilience, certainly in a, in a time of, uh, of a pandemic. And um, I, I have to say from uh, my vantage point, my lens in the, in the school district that uh, I've seen some incredible opportunities for how uh, our students, how our community have come together uh, around this topic of, uh, of resilience and, uh, and really found incredible ways to uh, to, to show and demonstrate that. So um, we are incredibly excited to bring this opportunity to you uh, this evening. I wanna offer just a couple of thank yous as we get started. First, a huge thank you to the Student Excellence Foundation that uh, uh, co-sponsored this uh, event or sponsored this event with us this evening. You're gonna have an opportunity to hear from Jennifer Merck um, from the Student Excellence Foundation. Uh, in just a moment and learn a little bit more about them. But I also wanna thank uh, our Board of Education for uh, helping to uh, make opportunities like this uh, available. Um, I know we've got some members of the Board of Education on the, uh, on the call this evening. I saw Brad Paulson, the, the board president. And so again, just a, a huge thank you and, uh, and recognition to uh, our board. And then finally, uh, a thank you to uh, members of, uh, of my team at the, the uh, district, uh, Dr. Chris Salagi, who's here with us this evening, along with uh, Mrs. Laocano, Erica Laocano, um, who's helping to, uh, to lead this conversation. We hope you get a lot out of it. Uh, we look forward to your engagement um, with us. There's an interactive uh, part as we move toward the end of this session tonight, where you're going to help uh, us to continue to frame this conversation around um, how we, we build resilience, how we recognize the positive at the, in the time of a pandemic. And so um, thank you so much. And uh, with, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it back to uh, Erica to get us going. The names of your hosts tonight. So um, we have Dr. Schuler, our superintendent of schools, Dr. Chris Alagi, who is our assistant superintendent for student services. Uh, Jennifer Merck, who is the president of the Student Excellence Foundation Board. Um, my name is Erica Iacono, director of communications for the school district. And then we have our featured speaker, Dr. Bolton, who's going to speak with us uh, tonight as well. Um, so um, uh, Mrs. Merck is going to offer us a few introductory remarks. She's going to introduce Dr. Bolton, who will then uh, share his uh, inspiring message with us. Um, and then uh, Dr. Salagi is going to introduce you to a little interactive component that we've got for tonight. And then we will open it up for questions and answers that any of you have. Um, when it, we do come to the, question, the portion of the evening for Q&A, I am going to ask that you send those questions to me directly, Erica Loyakino, via the chat bar, um, so we can get those questions answered for you. Um, so without further ado, just give me a minute. I'm going to start screen sharing. Still admitting some in. Mrs. Mark. Thank you very much. Good evening, District 200 parents. It's good to see you here. I'm Jennifer Merck, president of the Student Excellence Foundation, which is the educational foundation for District 200. We are delighted to bring you this workshop this evening. Opportunities like this are part of what the foundation does to engage, enrich, and empower our learning community. Last April, the foundation began the Food and Security Crisis Fund, focused on meeting the food needs of students and their families in this season. In October, the foundation expanded the Food and Security Crisis Fund to become the Essential Needs Fund, continuing to meet food and security needs while also providing for winter weather gear and learning enrichment materials. This year, for the first time ever, the foundation is providing eight college scholarships 
to District 200 seniors, four at Wheaton North and four at Wheaton Warrenville South. Typically in November, the foundation holds a STEM expo. We took a pause uh, this past fall, but we hope to gather again uh, next fall if possible. And after taking a semester off because of the challenges of schooling in this season, the foundation is once again offering student excellence grants to innovative educators this spring. With deep respect for the challenges the District 200 staff have experienced this school year, the foundation inaugurated a Stars of the Week program this winter. Educators and building staff across the district nominated their colleagues as stars. Each week from March to June, the foundation will honor one educator and one staff member from each of two buildings. And we hope that you'll look for these celebratory posts on social media in the coming weeks. Community nominations for our annual Distinguished Educator Awards will begin on March 1st, so look for those. And they will culminate in a virtual Celebrate Our Stars event in June. We're excited this evening uh, to announce that the foundation is getting ready to invest in its website as a tool for effective communication in District 200. We look forward to rolling that out, um, a new website in the next few months. In this challenging season, we're deeply grateful for our partnerships with the district, the Board of Education and our community. Supporting District 200 students, educators and classrooms is our work as we engage the community to enrich educational experiences that empower students to reach their greatest potential. We could not do this work without your contributions. It's my privilege this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Doug Bolton. Dr. Bolton is a clinical psychologist with formative psychological services in Northbrook and Chicago. He has spent his career working in schools, first as a school psychologist, and most recently as the principal of North Shore Academy, a therapeutic school in Highland Park. Currently, he has a private practice and consults with schools to support the emotional, the healthy emotional development of students. This evening, Dr. Bolton will speak with us on cultivating resilience during COVID-19. He hopes to help guide us through these challenging times by highlighting strategies that will build resilience in our children so they can effectively manage stress now and in the future. Dr. Bolton will help us answer a profound question, one that is for each of us as well as for our children. Is it possible that we can not just cope but thrive? And with that, let's turn the screen over to Dr. Doug Bolton. Jennifer, thank you so much. And I'm so delighted to be here. And it's so inspiring to hear all that the Student Excellence Foundation has done. It's, it's really, really remarkable. And I believe that it's these um, parent family community partnerships that really drive the best in our schools. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm, really, I'm really honored to be here. Um, so I think it was probably, um, it was probably in, late April, early May, when the impact of the pandemic really started to hit me. And I, I was really struggling with my career was, you know, I just left the school and I was consulting and I was trying to figure out and all of a sudden schools were closing and, uh, um, and I was doing professional development, but people weren't meeting for professional development. Um, you know, I'd never been in a time when um, store shelves were empty. And, and I remember thinking and wishing that there was somebody who's been through a pandemic that could help me through this. And I actually thought then of my grandmother. Um, she's not around anymore, but she was born in 1899. And I thought, I started thinking about all that she had been through in her life. She lived just outside of New York City. And when she was just seven, she was born in 1899. And when she was just seven, there was an outbreak of typhoid fever. When she was 15, World War I broke out. Over 100,000 soldiers died. Two years later was a polio outbreak. I can't imagine how frightening that must have been for parents. And then just two years after that, we all have heard about the Spanish flu that took over 675,000 American lives and um, close to 100 million lives across the globe. All of that before she was 20. 
But then the Roaring Twenties came, right? Um, I love this picture of her. Um, it, it, it could be right out of a magazine. And, and during that time, I think she started to thrive. She met my, uh, my grandfather, Walt, and they were married. And in February of 1929, they had their only child, my father. But we all know what happened just a few months later, right? The stock market crashes and we're plunged into the Great Depression. And then after that, World War II, where we lost over 400,000 lives. And yet during this time, she had been through all of that. And then she suffered her own personal crisis. My grandfather died of suddenly of a heart attack. And yet I knew my grandmother, not as a person who lived through all that suffering. I knew my grandmother as a person who held our family together when my parents divorced, she was the person that we leaned on. And I never heard these stories of how hard her childhood was. I only saw how she kept us together. She had a real weight with kids, didn't she? I love this, I love this picture. My brother sent it to me. I said, I need a picture with Graham. Can you send something? And he's got all the pictures and this is the one he sent. So I, I, uh, I thought I'd share this, right? But what do we call this generation of people who lived through two world wars, a pandemic, um, and the depression. We call them the greatest generation, don't we? And so I wish that she was around because I wanted to see what made her resilient. So how can we understand how we can be resilient? We're coming up on a year now, aren't we? How do we cultivate resilience in our children? And is it possible that we cannot just cope during this time, but is it possible that we can thrive? So three themes I wanna hit on tonight. How do we manage our own stress? Because how we manage our stress will be, have a big impact on how our kids manage their stress. Second is how do we take care of our kids? This is a unique time. And then finally, how can we think differently about this time? So COVID-19, you know, they call it the novel coronavirus. I think it's a great name because we've never really experienced anything like this in generations, have we? There's a consistency to this. There's always a threat that we are either getting, that we may transmit the disease or we may get the disease. There's constant economic threat, especially for um, certain members of our community. There's an intensity to this. People are losing their lives. People are getting very, very sick. People are losing their jobs. And all of us, even if we haven't lost our jobs, teachers have had to completely undo and redo what they did. Within, within just a couple of weeks, they were able to transform what they did, but how intense that was. And all of us have had to learn, how do we work remotely? There's an enduring quality to this. Did anyone else wonder on, I think it was March 13th, when they, when, uh, when they said, we're gonna shut down until April 7th. I thought, how am I gonna make it till April 7th? And then here we are almost a year later. And then finally, there are very few stresses that impact everybody on the globe. David Brooks said, if coronavirus is, was the earthquake that hit our country, the racial and social upheaval is the hurricane that came after. What we do know is that we have been inundated with stresses, both regulated to the virus, but also related to our social and racial and political selves. And we all have our own relationship to this, don't we? But it's all very personal and it's very impactful for each of us. It's really an extraordinary time with extraordinary stress. But I also believe, and we'll get to this, that there's extraordinary opportunity. So how do we understand and cope with this stress? So one of the things that, that I think is pretty common knowledge now is that stress pushes us into lower parts of our brain. When we are stressed, our body is geared towards movement. It's geared towards fight and flight and freeze. And what ends up happening is that we end up losing access to that wonderful cortex of ours because we need the energy to fight, right? And this is all based on our autonomic nervous system. And there's it's a very, very primitive system. There are only two paths to the system. There's the sympathetic nervous system, which triggers that stress response, which triggers 
that fight, flight, or freeze. And then there's the parasympathetic nervous system, which returns us to homeostasis, which calms us down and helps us recover. The thing is, it's an either or system. One is on when the other's off. It's like you can't be on two train tracks at the same time, right? And so the challenge is that it's meant to respond to a real and immediate threat. That's what fear is. It's our response to a real and immediate threat. And what's supposed to happen is the grizzly bear. We see the grizzly bear, we run, we get energy like we've never had. We've never run so fast. We get to safety and it comes back down. Our stress response system is supposed to be temporary and we're supposed to spend most of our time in homeostasis. This is such a primitive system that every multi-celled organism has a system like this, where you've got a stress response and then you go back to homeostasis. Every lizard has a system like this, right? But what evolution did, that wonderful evolution put this amazingly complex cortex on top of this incredibly primitive system. And what that gave us is anxiety. So if fear is our response to a real and immediate threat, anxiety is our response to thoughts about potential threats. And this is a really important distinction because what this cortex allows us to do is it allows us to be time travelers, doesn't it? We can worry what's gonna happen to my kids after a year of, uh, of remote learning? What's gonna happen to my kids who've missed a season of their sports leagues? What's gonna happen to my parents who are in a nursing home? All of these things, what's gonna happen? Will, will my child have the same opportunities in college after this? We all have things that we worry about in the future. And we're also mind readers. What it does is it makes us think, I wonder if my children are okay. They don't look very happy. I wonder what they're thinking. I wonder what my boss is thinking or my neighbor or my spouse. We're constantly wondering what other people are thinking. And the problem is, we're really not very good at predicting the future and we're really not very good at mind reading. But our, bodies re our body responds, our brain responds as if these beliefs are true. And so what happens with coronavirus when there's so many things that can impact us is that we are surrounded with stresses. And so our stress response system never gets a chance to go back down, right? So why do we have anxiety? Anxiety is protective. It is, it is meant to keep us alive. Anxiety is actually a wonderful thing. It's like, a, it, like it has a map of this minefield ahead of us. It says, here's where all the mines are. It doesn't have the ones, the problem is it doesn't tell you which ones are alive and which ones aren't, but it says, here's all the things that could cause you danger. But the problem is anxiety is often wrong. I've got a smoke detector that's right outside of my kitchen. This thing has gone off dozens and dozens and dozens of times and never have I had a fire. This is the way anxiety is supposed to work. It's not supposed to be accurate. It's not supposed to only go off if there's a, a fire. What it does is it alerts you to anything that may be a problem. The things that we get anxious about, these thoughts are not irrational, but they're also not true. But our body responds as if they are true. And so what happens in coronavirus is that for much, much, much more frequently, our stress response is getting triggered. And when that happens, we lose really important tools, don't we? We're not as good at listening. We're not as creative. We're not as flexible. We don't have the same amount of empathy. Our memory struggles. We're not as good at language. We either can't find the words or... Or for some of us, we use more four-letter words than maybe we've used before. Partly because we also struggle with our inhibition. We're more impulsive, right? This is what happens when we are under stress. I feel like my brain has felt like this a lot lately. And as a result, lots of people don't feel like they're the same parents as they typically are, or the same friends, or the same spouses or colleagues. And I'm not sure about all of you, but I haven't had the same energy or focus or motivation or optimism that I often have. I was dragging today. I don't know why. I haven't been sleeping as well. All of these things, it, there's a cumulative impact, I think, of all of these things. And so in order to make this work, 
We need to manually override our autonomic nervous system. Everything is pushing it to that stress response. But what we want to do is we want to return it to homeostasis. That's the thing. And so how do we do that? Well, the top three are diet, sleep, and exercise. These are some of the ways, and I know you've heard about this. I think that the diet challenge is, is in the grocery store and not necessarily in the kitchen. When it gets in my kitchen, I'm going to eat it. But we need to make sure that we are filling our bodies with things that are going to sustain us and keep us healthy. Sleep, I mentioned sleep earlier. Even though we may have more trouble sleeping, it's important that we and our kids not get into bad sleep habits. Exercise is really important. This is not a time that we necessarily have to learn, train for a marathon, but it is really important that we get movement in our lives, especially outdoor movement. It's amazing how regulating that can be, walking the dog, um, um, taking a walk, whatever it may be, having a snowball fight with your kids, whatever that may be, but getting outside, getting movement is important. Hobbies are wonderful. And I think for a lot of people who don't feel like they've got the same energy, they, they let their hobbies go. But one of the nice things about hobbies is in this world that is so unpredictable and so hard to navigate, with our hobbies, we are creating something and we're focusing on something that's not in the future and that we don't have these same worries because we are worried about the crossword puzzle we're doing, the woodworking project, the scrapbooking, whatever it may be, that hobbies are really important not to let go of. The thing about routines that's so important is especially in times when we can't predict the long-term future. And this has really been a challenge for all of us. One of the things that routines do is when we can predict what's happening in the short run, when I know what's gonna happen in the next um, in the next hour, when I know what my routine is in the morning, it means that that stress response system can quiet down. And so getting into routines, and one of the things that's been challenging for, for schools has been that their routines are totally different than they typically are, right? And at home, routines are totally different than they are in a typical school year. So making sure that we've got those routines. Connection is probably the most important thing that reconnects us, that, that, that allows us to access that homeostasis, that allows us to calm down. There are friends in my life who I've lost touch with because I don't see them as much and we don't go out as much. And I do think that one of the things that's so important is that we not lose connection with those folks, that we find different ways of connecting. Um, my family, we, uh, my family was, we never were connected, my siblings and I. Um, until coronavirus. And now we have our coffee and tea first thing in the morning on Saturday morning. Mindfulness and breathing. These are two. Let's see, something's happening on my, uh, <laughs> on my screen. I'm not sure if there's anything I can do about it. I'm going to um, stop the share and then I'm going to reshare it. Okay. I'm not sure what happened, but I'm going to stop sharing. I'll just reshare this and get that back up. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay, here we go. Um, so the beautiful thing about mindfulness is that it quiets the time traveler and mindfulness quiets our mind reader. And what it does is it focuses us on the here and now and it can give us that break and get us back into homeostasis. There's the, there are tons of apps. We could spend a week talking about the impact of mindfulness and breathing. The thing about breathing is that there are actually nerve endings in the autonomic nervous system attached to our, to our lungs. And what happens when we get through something that's really stressful? We breathe a sigh of relief, don't we? And what that does is it indicates to the rest of our body that everything's okay. Because if you're, if you're being chased by a grizzly bear, you cannot exhale that way. And so there are a lot of great breathing apps too. A couple minutes of mindfulness, a couple minutes of breathing every day can have a huge impact on our wellness and well being. I love the research on gratitude. One of the things about gratitude, um, one of the studies on gratitude that I like so much is a study where they had people doing um, gratitude journals every night before they went to bed. They would write down three things they were grateful for from that day. 
discrete events, not these big events like I'm grateful to have a roof over my head or I'm grateful for a loving family. It is I'm grateful for um, the note that my teacher sent home to me about my child. I'm grateful um, that my kids were laughing when they were cleaning up after dinner instead of arguing those moments of gratitude. And after just one week of doing those gratitude journals, they left them alone for six months and they came back and on, um, on rating scales of anxiety and depression, they were less anxious and depressed six months later than the people who did not participate in the gratitude journals. Gratitude, mindfulness and breathing, all of these things have been associated with decreases in anxiety, decreases in depression at the same, uh, at the same or more than you get from taking antidepressant or anti-anxiety meds. Speaking of meds, would you take a pill that creates a misperception of risk, increases your anxiety, increases learned helplessness, feelings of contempt and hostility, and decreases your mood? Most people wouldn't take this, right? But at some level, we all do. This is what happens when we watch the news. And I like Lester Holt. I, there's nothing wrong with Lester Holt. And this is a time when we need to be able to be informed, right? But we may not realize it but all of the distressing things that are happening in this world can trigger our stress response without us, real, without us recognizing it. I learned about doom scrolling. I'm like, I am a doom scroller. I will spend more time focusing on these articles on my news feeds that are just not good for me to be reading. And I may just, if I pay attention to what's happening in my body, what I'll find is after 10 or 15 minutes of reading these articles, I will feel more tense. So what we need to do is we need to curate. We need to figure out what is it that is healthy for us and, and what isn't. Social media is great at staying connected to people and providing us with information. What we need to do is make sure that it's not triggering our stress response. And finally, this idea of impermanence. One of the things that I realized in, the, in these hardest moments, and as I was reading, um, um, how to navigate these hard moments is the idea of impermanence continued to come up. And even during coronavirus, there has been time that I, times that I felt like we've got this, right? Everything's okay. But it's only a matter of time before I feel like I'm getting crushed by the waves of this thing. And what I realized is that this is the way life is outside of coronavirus too, isn't it? That every time I've been up in my life, there's been a time that I've been down. And every time I'm down, if I wait long enough, things are gonna turn around. This is just the way the life, that life works. And I need to be able to understand that when things are hard, I just need to wait and be patient. And we're gonna come out of this. And when things are really good, not to expect that, I, that, that, it's, not, that it's gonna stay that way, to know that life has these cycles. And it's true, not just in our own lives, but it's true in history, isn't it? A pandemic and a world war led to the Roaring Twenties, which led to a depression and World War II, which led to the greatest generation, right? All life is constantly in these cycles. So can we surf, right? Can we surf these waves? And this is a huge wave for us to surf. And so what I'd say is more than any other time, we just need to be intentional about these things. Are there things that you've let go of that have been helpful for you in, the law, in, your, in your daily life? Take a look at this list. What have you let go of that you need to put back in? What is something that you can add? Can you add a gratitude practice 10 minutes a day? Can you add a mindfulness practice five minutes a day? And there are apps for that. Can you get some outside activity every day? So take a look at that list. When things get hard, what will you fall back on? Right, how do we take care of our kids? When we are in lower brain, I talked about what happens. We're just not as sharp, right? And our kids are gonna have limitations and we're gonna have limitations. It's just the way it is. We're spending more time in what we like to call lower brain. And so we're not the same people, right? So that we wonder how will they cope? And so I wonder, is there opportunity in this? And I think that there is. The amazing thing about this time, as hard as it is, is that we cannot build resilience 
without stress. There's no way to do that. And so here's the most stressful time in our kids' lives in generations. It's also a time that we can teach resilience in a way we've never been able to teach it before. And I'll tell you what, our kids are already learning it and we're seeing it in our classrooms and you're seeing it and there are hard times and that's part of what happens with resilience. So how do we do this? The first step, I wanna to refer to um, D.W. Winnicott in the 1940s. He was a pediatrician and a psychoanalyst and he had a theory and his theory was called the good enough mother. And it, that was the 1940s, right? So this is a good enough mother, good enough father, good enough teacher, good enough uncle. We just need to be good enough. And what he says is that in a time when there was all, all of the wisdom said, in order for your kids to be successful, you need to do these things just right. And if you don't, your kid will be unsuccessful. What Winnicott said is babies and children actually benefit when their mothers fail them in manageable ways. What happens is when we are late to pick them up at, at their practice, when we um, struggle, uh, when we lose our temper with them, what ends up happening is they're needing to cope with something. And by learning how to cope in those moments, um, they are gonna, we are preparing them to cope with harder things later on. One of the places where this showed up, my daughter is an amazingly hardworking student and she had her SAT um, on a Saturday morning and she had studied honestly a little bit every day for a year so that she could perform well. And she had her morning laid out to the split second and she said, all you've got to do, dad, is get me the car in the morning by 7.30. And I um, was taking a walk by, I live in Evanston. I was taking a walk by the water. I drive back up. I, um, I pass her. She's walking out at 7.28. I'm feeling good about myself. I wish her luck. She gets in the car. And five minutes later, she's back. And she says, dad, there's no gas. I completely threw off her morning. I'm like, I, I, I'm like, so, so then we tried to problem solve. She says, I'll just go get, I'll just go get gas. Um, and, uh, and I gave her the credit card so she could get the gas. And she was later than she wanted to be. And she, everything worked out okay. I felt terrible, but the lesson for her was even when we've got everything planned out, things can get in the way and she was still there on time. And maybe the stress meant that she, she lost a couple of points on her SAT. I don't know, we'll never know but it wasn't the end of the world. And that was her lesson there, right? That when we fail our kids, they have to learn and they step up and that's how they become resilient. But the challenge is that our inner critic as parents is so loud. And I think we've got our inner critic as parents in this generation is especially loud. Anytime our child is struggling, we believe that it's our job to fix it. And in fixing it, we often keep them from the opportunity to navigate that stress themselves. All we have to do is survive this storm though, right? Like I, I picture us on this pier and it's gonna be ugly. We're gonna, our hair is gonna be a mess. We're gonna be all wrinkled, but we're gonna be on that pier holding our hands of our kids and their teachers and our neighbors and our family. And as long as we make it through, that's our task right now. Brene Brown says, the. Sometimes the bravest and most important thing you can do is just show up. And Dan Siegel, who is kind of the modern day um, um, child development specialist, he and Tina Bryson wrote a book called The Power of Just Showing Up. And what they talk about is how parental presence shapes who our kids become and how their brains get wired. It's not how parental perfection, it's how our presence changes them. And what they talk about in showing up is four different pieces. Kids need to feel safe and seen and soothed and secure. And so with safety, we need to protect them from harm. And we've been doing that. We've been wearing masks and we've been, there's never been a time that we've tried to protect them from physical harm more than we have in the last year, right? But there's also psychological harm. I'm, this is my mom with me and my little sister. And I'm not sure what it is that we're looking at, but I clearly it's we would have left it if it was something big and scary and threatening. But there's that psychological safety of feeling like everything's going to be okay. And that's what we want is our kids to also feel 
psychologically safe. And in order to do that, we need to be avoid becoming the source of fear. And the mistake we make, and I'm not sure if you guys have made this mistake, but I certainly have, is I've lost it with my kids during this time more than I typically do. And there are gonna be times when we lose our temper. And this is gonna be a time when we are in lower brain and we're more impulsive that we're gonna lose our temper more often. And so the key thing is that it's okay if we lose our temper, but in those moments, what we've got to realize is we need to take care of ourselves, right? We need to forgive ourselves and then we need to make it right. And in making it right, our kids are gonna learn how to make it right when they lose their temper. That's their opportunity. Second is we got to help kids feel seen and helping kids feel seen is really this being attuned to their feelings and being curious. Can we see life through their eyes? Right, this, is, this coronavirus is very different through their eyes than it is through our eyes. The amazing thing about child development is that when our kids are infants, we are hardwired to mimic their facial expressions, aren't we? Do you remember when your kid was that young and they'd make a face and we'd make that face? What's happening is they're experiencing an emotion and it's showing up in their face. And then when we mimic that, they're seeing, oh, that's what that feels like. It is, the, it is one of the building blocks of social emotional learning. And it's happening all the time, isn't it? With our young kids. Some people take it too far. I don't think this is all that helpful. But here's the thing, as kids get older, it looks like this, doesn't it? What we wanna let communicate is that feelings are both real and they're fleeting. Just like our feelings are, we've gotta surf our feelings, we wanna teach our kids to surf their feelings. And can we help them realize that their feelings are real even if they aren't feelings that we share? But the mistakes we make is we try and fix those feelings, don't we? We try and take it away. We try, or we minimize their distress. Why would you worry about that? Or we shame them. That's a ridiculous way to act. You shouldn't, it, um, and, and, and when we say these things, it is, it is, um, it is damaging to their ability to cope with these feelings um, on their own. And so what we want to do is instead of trying to fix or minimize, what we wanna do is to soothe them. And what soothing is about is returning them to their homeostasis, right? But first you've gotta soothe yourself. When little people are overwhelmed by big emotions, it's our job to share our calm, not join their chaos. This is the tricky part for me is when my kids are distressed, I get distressed. But what I need to do is if I can bring my calm self, it can be a calming influence on them. And I like this term called just holding space. You can see this child is distressed. The mother isn't trying to fix it, but the mother's just being present, right? And attuned. And ideally, what happens is we help kids learn how to soothe themselves. This is the holy grail, isn't it? And so for younger kids, it may be going and, and uh, um, holding on to a teddy bear or playing with Legos. For older kids, it may be putting in their AirPods, taking the dog for a walk, whatever that may be. But we wanna help them learn how they soothe themselves. But the mistake we make is we punish instead of soothe, don't we? When they get distressed, we often will quickly punish. And I like this picture. Clearly this boy's been put on timeout and he's facing the wall. Look at how much shame is in his body language. His head is down, but there he is with Charlie. And I guess what I'd want to say is not go take a timeout. You've been disrespectful. What I'd like to say is you're having a hard time. Why don't you and Charlie go downstairs and when you're ready, come on back up and we'll figure this out together. I've got to calm myself down too, right? It's amazing what time can do when we are distressed. It's amazing what time can do when we're melting down. And it's also amazing what time can do because this is all developmental. These are all skills that kids are learning. And the more we can learn, teach them how to soothe instead of how to respond to punishment, the goal is to help them soothe themselves so they don't, so that they will be able to handle these situations better in the future. And so finally, if kids are feeling safe and seen and soothed, 
that gives them a secure base with which they can go out and face the world. And that's the challenge is how do they face the world? I like this quote, you have within you right now, everything you need to deal with whatever the world can throw at you. And here's the thing, the world has thrown everything at our kids, hasn't it? It's thrown everything at us and they're adapting and we're adapting and it's not always pretty, but we're making it. In order to do this, we really need to take care of ourselves. I know I'm beating a dead horse, but this is how we do it. And we need to realize that good enough is good enough. And that there's beauty in imperfection because when we fail, our kids see that we can fail too. And they see how do we respond to failure? How do we respond to imperfection? And then they learn how to do that. If we can forgive ourselves and when we blow it with our kids, can we apologize? We are setting a model for how to do this with them. I like what James Baldwin said. He said, children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. Our kids are watching us and they're watching us be resilient. They're watching us adapt. And in doing so, they are learning how to be resilient and they are learning how to adapt. That's our work. Nenea Hoffman says, note to self, all you have to do is show up, be late, be scared, be a mess, be weird, be confused. Just be there. You and your kids will figure out the rest as you go. All right, finally, how do we think differently about this time? Can we think differently about resilience? Tom Boyce did this amazing research. He, he studied tens of thousands of kids um, from preschool all the way through high school graduation. And he was observing them in classrooms and he was taking saliva samples to understand their stress. He was studying them like it, um, their complete lives. And what he found is he said, some kids are dandelions and some kids are orchid kids. He said, the dandelion kids, they can cope with just about anything that comes their way. They can grow up between the cracks of concrete. They can handle a storm. It's not pretty, it's not easy, but they can handle just about whatever the world throws at them. The thing about orchid kids is they are more sensitive. The light needs to be right. The soil needs to be right. They need to get just the right amount of water. But if we get it just right with them, it's amazing how beautiful these orchid kids can become, how they can contribute to the world in beautiful and unique ways. And what he said is that 80% of kids are actually dandelion kids. 80% of the kids can handle just about whatever the world throws at them. And when I talk to teachers, when I talk to parents, they say, this has been a really hard time, but the kids are doing okay. Most of them are doing okay. Resilience is the norm and not the exception. We don't need to worry about all the kids, but there are kids that we need to be especially attentive to. Those are our orchid kids. And it's interesting, some of the, we found some orchid kids. There are some kids, every teacher will tell you, there are some kids who love remote learning and who've come alive in remote learning in a way that they didn't um, when they have to manage the stresses of every day being in the building every day. Those are orchid kids, right? You change the environment and look at what happens to them. And there are kids, who are really struggling during this time in ways they don't struggle when there is um, in-person learning. And what we wanna do is we wanna ask, one of the things that we do as parents is we just assume, we say, well, um, you need to be more motivated. You're, uh, um, um, you're lazy or, um, um, or you are, um, you know, you're impatient, whatever it may be. What we wanna do for our ORCID kids is just to ask, That'll help us be attuned to them, won't it? Checking in and seeing what's going on for you. You seem down. Um, and they may or may not be able to identify what it is, but let's, let's continue to try and get their soil right. Let's continue to try and water them in the ways that they need to be watered. Can we think differently about our own stress? Anyone else spend a lot of time like this in the last year? Um, it begins with us. Our emotional regulation is more important than ever for our kids. And we need to watch for it. The places that I think it often, when I get um, dysregulated, when I notice other people, I often see it more in the realm of flexibility and empathy. 
when you find yourself or someone else saying, I don't care, this is ridiculous, I'm not going to do it that way, I don't care what they think, whenever you start to hear that come out of your mouth or someone else's mouth, just know that they're in lower brain, that they're experiencing stress. And it's time as much as we can to be able to step away from that. Dysregulation is contagious. When we're dysregulated, if you notice that it's much more, your kids are much more quick to get dysregulated and vice versa. The other thing is the hallmarks of our dysregulation is there's a sense of urgency. I've got to figure this out now. I've got to nip this in the bud right now. And there's an exaggeration. If they don't get, um, you know, if they, if things don't happen right away, then they're going to be a, a 25 year old who, uh, who's not engaged in academics, right? Who doesn't do their homework, whatever it may be. Um, and so we exaggerate this. We have this sense of urgency and this sense of exaggeration, which further fuels our own dysregulation. And so I've had to tuck my crazy back in a lot more in this last year than I typically do. And that's an important piece for all of us, right? I'm beating a dead horse, I know, but these are the things that we need to do in those moments. Can we think differently about connection? One of the things that's so interesting about this time, and we've had a lot of worries, understandable worries about the impact of kids not being with their peers, but I guess we haven't talked as much about the benefit of kids being with parents. Kids have spent much more time with us as parents. And in that way, they've had much more time to embrace our values, haven't they? They've had much more time to watch us. Kids have watched us at work, right? They've walked in on our Zoom meetings. They've overheard us. They have been able to see us in ways they've never been able to see us before. There are opportunities in this. I've, I'm, excuse me. I've talked to a number of high school families where they play board games every night. When would that happen without the coronavirus, right? There are things that are happening in our families and our kids, even though they are losing one form of socialization. And we've got to, and there's reason to be concerned about that. I also want to say they're getting another. And what I would say is in these times, in these moments that we're together as a family, let's tell our stories of coronavirus. Let's tell our stories of gratitude, the things that we were surprised about. Let's also tell our stories of challenge, because it's in these stories that we're going to start to make sense of this whole pandemic. Humans think in stories, and we try to make sense of the world by telling stories. And so this is how families will make sense of this. And by telling your stories of, the of your frustration, they will understand that you've gotten frustrated too. They will then learn how to manage their frustration by hearing your stories. The other thing that I think is so interesting is that the connection between parents and kids and teachers is very different. We've been able to look into each other's homes. Your, your kids have seen into your teacher's homes and we've seen into your homes and we've, you've watched teachers teach. There's all sorts of things that are happening that never happened before. And I hope that we can take this with us and that our connection with teachers will, will always be a little bit closer with greater appreciation and teachers' appreciation of parents, the same thing, right? Finally, can we think differently about achievement? Kids' brains are not gonna be as available because they're gonna be in lower brain more, because the learning platforms have changed, because your teachers are not gonna be able to, they don't have the same learning platforms as they typically do, even with socially distanced learning, everything is different. They've got to focus on very different routines. A lot is harder for everybody. They will get what they need achievement-wise, I promise. But this is a time when kids are learning resilience. I was talking to a superintendent and I said to her, I said, you know, I think that back in London in, two, in, in World War II, when they were doing the bombing, I think they pushed the kids out to the country and those kids didn't get school for a couple of years. And I said, and nobody looks at that generation and says, wow, what a dumb generation that was. Look at how those people failed. No, nobody says that. In fact, they had the greatest generation as well in Britain after World War II. And so she said, you know, it's interesting. My dad was in, lived in London in World War II. And you're right, they moved out to the country and they had no school. I said, well, what happened to him? And she said, well, he ended up 
coming to America and got his PhD at the University of Rochester. And I will add that his daughter became a superintendent of schools. Things worked out okay. Kids' brains do not turn on the moment they walk in the school building and then shut down the moment they leave. Our kids are constantly learning, whether it be remote, whether it be in person, they are still always learning. One of the things that happened in my private practice was that um, um, kids and families would come in and say, this coronavirus is brutal. This remote learning is so hard. But I'll tell you what, we don't have homework battles at night. And what I would say is we worry so much about homework and homework and homework. And what I want to say is the research isn't great with homework in elementary school. I just want to put that out there. It's important, but it's not it's not terribly essential. One of the things that's happening though, that is important is when kids can have a relaxed evening at home. If homework is incredibly stressful, talk to the teacher about it. In this coronavirus, there are so many stresses they're dealing with and kids are gonna learn better if they have a nice relaxed night with their parents at home, get a good night's sleep and head off to school in the morning. So if your child is struggling with homework, let's rethink that, right? Let's partner with teachers to figure out what do they need and how can we get through this? I wanna be very careful. This is a, what we're talking about is something called tragic optimism, which is the ability to maintain hope and find meaning in life despite its inescapable pain, loss and suffering. This is not to diminish how hard this time is, but it is important that we make a connection that this is also how we build resilience. And every time we've built resilience, it's been on the backs of something that's been very hard for us. And this is the flip side of coronavirus. Coronavirus came in and turned our world upside down, didn't it? It shattered our lives. Napoleon Hill said, opportunity often comes disguised in the form of misfortune or temporary defeat. And I can't think of a year where have I have felt more misfortune or more defeat than I have this past year. But here's the thing, we cannot helicopter parent our kids out of this stress, can we? And we can't snowplow parent, we can't protect them from this. They're having to deal with this stress. And I believe that in dealing with this stress, we are learning and they are learning how to cope with stress for the future and when we rebuild, we're starting to come out of this. And when we rebuild from this, we need to take a look at what have we learned from this time? Schools need to take a look at what have we learned? And as parents, we've got to figure out what have we learned? One of the things that has happened since kids haven't been overscheduled is they're sleeping longer. It's amazing some of the lessons. So what do we keep? In my family, we started doing, I've got a private practice. I almost never was home for dinner. All of a sudden, I started, uh, when my private practice, everything fell off, I started having dinner at home. We had dinner for four months straight in my house and we never had. And I decided I've got to change my schedule so that I can still be home for dinner every night. That's one of the things that I'm going to keep. And what am I going to let go of? These are the questions we need to ask and we need to be intentional. Because when we pull back the curtain of coronavirus and the light shines in again, I believe we're gonna have a generation of kids that is more independent, more resilient and more community focused because during this time we've asked kids to be more dependent than they've been in the last several generations. We're asking them to be more resilient than they've ever had to be. And we're solving this as a community. They are seeing teachers and parents come together. They are seeing communities come together to wear masks for one another, to socially distance. They're seeing that the only way we get through this is as a community. And this is what's going to define our next generation. 10 years from now, what will our children remember? I don't think they're going to say my punctuation lesson in fourth grade wasn't very good. And so I didn't capitalize any of my essay for my MFA program at Michigan. I don't think they're going to say that. What they're going to say is, Coronavirus knocked us all down, took us all out at the knees and we adapted. And they're gonna say, I watched my teachers adapt. And they're gonna say, I watched my parents adapt and we made it through and it was hard and we did it. 
two world wars, a pandemic and a depression led to the greatest generation. And I believe this is gonna be a generation of resilience if we can cultivate this. That's our work. Ernest Hemingway said, the world breaks everyone. And afterwards, some are strong at the broken places. I believe that we're all gonna be stronger. We are gonna be stronger. Our kids are gonna be stronger. Coronavirus came in and wrote the story for the last year for us. It took the pen out of our hands. We were writing a great story for ourselves, weren't we? Coronavirus came in and changed all that, but we get to write the next chapter, don't we? And I'm so excited to see what we write together. And that's our work. All right, so we'll get some questions, but I just wanna give a little teaser to March 16th, I'm gonna be back. Um, I hope you still want me back, but I'm gonna be back. And, uh, and we're gonna be talking about digging deeper into how do we understand stress. And I'll tell you what, you will learn how to increase your life expectancy by 43% if you come back on March 16th. So there you go, right? How can you miss that? Thank you so much, Dr. Bolden. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't even get your last slide up there. I don't mean to cut you off, you got one more no, slide. No, that's fine. no, no, I'll just leave that up. If anyone wants to get in touch with me, please feel free to reach out. Um, um, I'd love to help in any way I can. Dr. Bowen, we are going to keep you on. I want to thank you for a, for a great, great message and presentation to our school community. Um, we are going to keep you on for uh, a Q&A after this. But before we do that, um, a timely piece, and, and Dr. Bolton, you alluded to this, that we have asked families and parents to partner with us and be part of their child's education um, in a different and, and, and more than we ever have before. And uh, over the next few months, we are really want to ask our parents and our school community for feedback on that partnership. And really in, in realms of two specific questions, we're gonna be speaking or seeking their feedback on. One, we wanna know what have we learned from this pandemic that we should keep in our school system? And I think you, you alluded to that a little bit, um, but we also want parent feedback and input on what have our kids lost during this altered year of learning? Um, we feel that the answers to these two questions can not only help us in our immediate planning, but also in our future planning. And so we are actually going to launch that conversation tonight through a tool called Thought Exchange. Um, so in a moment, Ms. Lalakano is actually going to put these two links into our chat bar. And at any time, you can access these links. And there are two separate questions. Again, the first is, what has been learned from this pandemic that we should keep in our school system? And the second is, what have kids lost during this altered year of learning. Now, some of you may be familiar with Thought Exchange. If you remember last year, uh, during our Portrait of a Graduate work, we utilized this tool. Uh, anybody with an internet connection through a phone, computer can use this tool. Uh, you simply access the link. It is completely confidential. Um, it will ask you uh, who you are. Are you a parent, a uh, parent of what grade level? And then it will ask you to give us your thoughts. Simply write your thoughts down. The second part of Thought Exchange, though, also allows you to see what everybody else who has participated in this conversation has said. And you can go through and see different people's thoughts and rate them one to five, giving them one stars or five stars for strongly agree. We encourage people not only to share their own thoughts to these two questions, but to rate other people's thoughts. Uh, we launched this conversation last week with a smaller group in our Citizens Advisories Committee. So you will see some input already in there. And the good thing about this tool is on the back end, we have analytics that allows us to see different themes and to really break down the input that will really inform us on, on what immediate needs are and what we need to be focusing on now and in the future as we plan, um, as we plan our education for, for our students. So uh, we encourage folks in that chat bar, Ms. Lackano, I believe, um, has put them in so you can see the, the link. If you just scroll up a little bit, please access those. And we will also, if you can't get to them tonight, we'll also be sharing those um, throughout, throughout our time. We'll be sending them out and pairing them also um, with a few other pieces. So this, this link will stay open. We can go back into them as well. So wanted to make sure we, we put that out there. Again, Dr. Bolton talked about, he'll be joining us again on March 16th for, for how we can manage meaning our stress. And we will also have even a follow-up to that um, on how we rebuild and continue to, to, to get better in our work. 
Um, so we're going to end tonight. We've got a few minutes left here with some Q&A. Ms. Leocno, um has asked you to share questions with her. So I'm going to turn it over to Erica. And if we've got some questions that we can share with Dr. Bowen with the time we have left, that'd be great. Thank you. And if you do have questions, please send those directly to me in the chat bar. So when you open up your chat, you can send the question directly to me because I know some people prefer to have their questions asked anonymously. So um, feel free to do that. Um, so Dr. Bolton, first question that we got in is that um, uh, this parent has a child that their stress is acting out um, through anger, showing a lot of anger and their child is starting to act out um, physically, not towards other individuals necessarily, but maybe towards other furniture or things like that. What are some suggestions you can have, you can offer uh, to that parent? So it's a, you know, it's common. Um, it's a common challenge, and I, there's a long response to this, but I'm going to try and make it as as brief as I can. You know, when we think about the times that we melt down, there's almost always a stress associated with it. Um, that that what, when your child is struggling in that way, it says they're experiencing stress. And so the question can be, how can we think about what are the things that are stressful for our child? And this work comes from the work of, of Stuart Shanker. And he's got a book called Self-Reg that, that I've just become acquainted to and I really like. So that's, I'm not sure if um, Erica or Chris, you can look it up. Um, but what it really speaks to is this idea of how can we see misbehavior is stress behavior. Our kids want to do well. Um, they don't want to beat up furniture. They don't want to be disrespectful to us. Just like when I get upset, I don't want to be disrespectful and say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or yell at my children. We all are hoping to do the right thing. And there are stresses that impact our ability to do that. And so the question becomes, how can we understand the stress that our kids are under in that moment? And for some of them, it's looking at the screen and we realize they need a break. They need a, a, a break at different points um, in time, right? And other times what we realize is that they, uh, um, 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 so exercise, we may wanna figure out how do we put in some regulation breaks for them. Um, they may need a little time on, a, a little quiet time when they can become overwhelmed by the stresses in their family or coming back from a long day at school that we, we may realize that they're not ready to sit down and do homework right away um, and that they need a break. So um, I would look for patterns. Are there times of the day or certain stresses that, that trigger that? And then how can we get in front of those? Um, and then I would say, um, let's figure out how we can get him as many, him or her as many regulation breaks as we can and figure out what is it that calms them and soothes them. Um, so that when they get to that place, um, we can help them calm down instead of expect punishment to be the thing that oftentimes the punishment will further trigger their dysregulation instead of help them calm. So I hope that made some sense. I, I, I could talk for a long time about this. So I'm trying to figure out how to condense it into a short, um, um, into a short um, answer. Thank you. Um, Another question uh, talks about students' anxiety about going into a school building. So um, at this time, our middle and high school students are um, in a hybrid learning model. And um, this question is, it relates, I think, more to a fear of going into school that the child has anxiety. But um, Dr. Bolton, we've also heard that um, from some parents that their child is experiencing anxiety simply because the school day is so very different than it was before. And that's stressful to them and produces anxiety. So um, how can better parents um, better support their children for the days that they're in person in school, regardless of what's the source of that anxiety? Yeah, so I think every child's, the nature of every child's anxiety is gonna be different. So that's tricky. I think the first thing I would do is, is really do my best to listen and understand what is it that is um, causing my particular child anxiety? What are the parts of the day that are hardest? Um, is it about the change in routines? Is it about um, 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 worried about um, whether their teacher likes them? Is it, what are the things that are leading? Every child will have different things that they're anxious about. So that's where the attunement comes in and is so important, is really doing our best to listen. And then what I would say is it's really important to partner with the school at that point. 
you know, the, the key thing, one of the things that needs to happen is how can we create a sense of belonging in the school so when the child comes in, there's a sense of, of, of emotional safety. Um, that will help if they're worried about the physical safety of contracting the virus or whatever. A lot of times um, having the emotional safety piece covered is important. But I would partner with the school, either the teacher or social worker, um, assistant principal, whoever that contact person is at the school. And I hope this is okay. Um, but that's, that's what I would do is to be able to say, let's partner around this um, so that we can help our child overcome. This is another, the opportunity for them to face a stress is a wonderful opportunity for them. And I, and I think that figuring out and watching us, part, watching us collaborate and partner is the most important thing that we can do. Um, so that's what I would say. I, I hope that that's, um, that's helpful. Um, um, and uh, just so that the, the people on the call know, I am going to get to as many questions as we're able to, but um, some of them kind of relate to the previous question we have, uh, asked. So if I, I may need to come back to some questions, so don't uh, worry, I will get back to it. Um, similar to that, Dr. Bolton, um, we, while you mentioned that um, it's been great that families have all this extra time together, um, but um, one kind of side effect that a parent is asking about is um, now their young child um, is fearful when they're not with their parent and has severe anxiety when uh, left, when, when without that parent, when they have to go to a grandparent's house or a caregiver's house or even to school without the parent. But um, I know you talked about school just now, but um, can you talk a little bit about anxiety about not being with parents that you've been with us for so long? Yeah, um, I'm not sure how old the child is, um, but yeah, I guess uh, first grade. First grade. Um, so I think that what I would try and do is is um, get out of the house as much as possible with them. Um, uh, you know, in and I think we're getting to a place where we're getting closer to doing that. Um, I would have them them continue to practice, um, figure out what I would say is. Um, helping them figure out what soothes them when they're anxious. So is it a teddy bear? Is it something that they can bring with them? And then I would practice being able with grandparents in particular, being able to say, um, you, know, I'm, you know, I'm not sure if they can leave the room, if they need to leave the house, but, but practice. But making sure that they've got um, both the relationship with someone they trust, as well as potentially something else that's soothing for them. If they like playing Legos, bring a Lego set. And they can be playing with Legos on the floor and say, why don't you get started on that? I'm going to be back in five minutes. Here's the watch and you can take a look and just help them slowly begin to make that um, experience that separation um, in those ways. So I, I, that, um, you know, if it's if it's extreme, I would seek help. You know, if, if you're really worried about this, um, you know, a, a two minute answer from me is not going to be as important as as really getting someone who can help you think through this and the nuances of what's happening for your child. Thank you. Um, a parent of a senior wrote in just talking about how her senior is feeling very defeated, um, has a lot of anxiety. I think we, we talked even at the end of last year, um, we had a parent workshop talking about um, how, to, how to deal with grief um, and loss and, um, you know, that, you know, missing certain aspects of a senior year is very difficult for um, a lot of our students. So how can uh, parents where maybe their students are at transition levels, like transition points, I mean, especially seniors in high school, how can parents best support their students? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I've got a senior um, and, and, you know, I think my, my senior is is a dandelion she's doing okay but the college search is certainly different and causing some stress because we haven't been able to visit any schools um she um but the loss of seasons or the loss of uh, friendships um the loss of proms the loss of of uh, uh plays whatever it may be can be really hard on seniors um and i guess uh, um, I think that I would, I would just try and stay present, um, with, with them. I, there's not anything we can do to, to give them a prom and there's nothing we can do to give them a, 
um, a specific um, uh, to help them feel less anxious. But what I would do is I would I would help them um, to just be present with them. Um, I would listen to them. I would give them as much time as I could, um, and I would let them know that we're going to get through this and trust that we're going to get through this. The thing is that there's an interesting statistic that 85% of people say that they handle current crises based on their ability to cope, having coped with a, for, a prior crisis, a prior tragedy in their lives. This will make them stronger. This will be something that they can fall back on, but at different points in time, it's gonna be heartbreaking. Um, and I think, I guess I wanna say that both are true, is that I think it can be heartbreaking. And when we get through this, um, there'll be stories about how much they missed, but also I think that they'll be better able to be ready to handle problems in college, better able to handle problems at work or in their families or whatever that may be for them. And that's my hope and my belief. Um, but I, I don't think that we can take away that sense of loss. I think we just have to figure out how do we cope with it. Thank you. Um, this is the last question we're gonna take for the evening. Just talking about how, um, how to balance screen time, um, especially for parents who tried before to limit that. But now um, a lot of times, depending on what level of grade you're your child is in. Um, screens are very much a part of school, but now also entertainment and socialization all happen on screens. Um, talk about how to balance the need for that socialization, learning environment, um, and access to maybe some entertainment, um, how to balance that, that screen time. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we've been telling kids to stay off their screens for so long. And then we've been telling them they've got to get on their Zoom meeting right away. You're going to be late for your for your Zoom class, right? Um, and so, and they see us on our devices. We are on our devices much more than we've ever been. Um, what I would say is that um, um, that the important thing is to give kids options. I think one of the things that we often do is we say get off your device, um, but we don't give them a whole lot of other options. You know, it's 11 degrees and it's dark at five o'clock. So it's not like go run around outside. What I would say is as a family, we all have to get off our devices. As a family, let's figure out um, for these times, um, can we um, have a routine where we've got um, a device-free evening? Um, that's, that's part of what we can capture if we can have the discipline ourselves so that our kids are getting um, social contact, but it's going to be social contact with us until, you know, hopefully in the spring, kids can get outside and play until 8.30 or 9 o'clock, whatever that looks like. But until then, um, I would say, let's make sure that we are all off our devices and that we are creating opportunities for connection with our kids. Um, that that's what I would say, bring them into the kitchen, teach them how to cook. Um, Take the, have them take the dog for the uh, for a walk with you, whatever that looks like. Um, but I think just asking them to get off of their device without giving them a good healthy option, I think makes it really, really hard for them then to figure out, well, what do I do? And then they become distressed because they don't have anything to do. And then they feel lonely because they don't have friends and their friends are all playing um, the video game online. Um, so I would give them an option. Um, and get out and try and get off our devices. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bolton. Uh, thank you to the Student Excellence Foundation for sponsoring this event tonight. And thank you so much to all the parents, staff, community members that joined us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, as we said, this meeting is recorded, so we will make those links that link available um, in the future. Um, we will include the links to the thought exchanges in an upcoming. Um, uh, written communication and also on our social media. But uh, please make sure to mark your calendars for Tuesday, March 16th at seven o'clock. And we'll talk to Dr. Bolton about uh, managing stress. And Dr. Bolton, what did you say? We can extend our life expectancy by how long? 43% um, by changing our relationship with stress. And I think we can help our kids do the same thing. So it's, it's a it's a little bit deeper dive into understanding stress and figuring out how can we empower ourselves um, during this time. So that's that's the hope is that we can do that and we can um, can help our kids do that. Thank you.
Thank you. Dr. Bolton, anything else you'd like to say before we end the meeting? No, I'm just so grateful. Um, thank you to all of you for having me. It's been, a, it's, it's been wonderful. In any way I can be helpful, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'd love to stay connected in this way and I'm excited to be coming back. Thank you. Good night, everybody.